Okay. No, he just said he would capture that for me. Oh, fabulous. Good evening, everybody. Comrades, brothers, sisters. Delighted to see you all. And thanks a million for coming to this particular fringe. We've got some um, tough competition. I won't tell you what it is, otherwise you might all sneak out. <laughs> but at the end, we might all be running over to the Cuba fringe for a, a, a tot of uh, a tot of rum. You never know. Um, so thanks a million for coming. And this is the London Unemployed Strategies Fringe, and that's my project, and it's um, hosted at the TUC and funded by Trust for London. It's been going about 14 years. I've been in post about two years. And uh, it's a, a coordinator role that uh, supports seven groups around London of um, people who are not working uh, at this moment, or we, we, I, we, I'll mention something about that in, in, a, in a moment about the way we word things. And uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer support. So people who are using social security come together in formal or informal settings, non-expert, very important that it's non-expert, and they help each other in whatever way is needed. It can be friendship, it can be uh, benefit support, it can be going along to assessments with each other. And uh, yeah, it's been, been really successful. Trust for London have funded it for what's the word, or rotations, which is really quite unusual. And uh, we're up for funding again, and it looks like they may fund us to continue. But um, it, the, it does need to diversify. And that's part of the reason why we're such a varied group here uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, PCS, we have Angela Grant, um, PCS DWP president, newly elected. So we can have a round of applause. And we have Brett Sparkles, as I like to call him. <laughs> Brett Sparks from uh, Unite, he's a Unite officer. And uh, Brett, um, I, I won't tell you what they're going to talk to us about because they'll, they'll introduce um, themselves. But the in work benefits uh, really changing. So my project was very firmly for people who are not currently working or who. who I, again, I'll, I'll correct my language on that. And maybe I'll, I'll correct it now, actually, rather than saying I'll do it in a moment. I'm very um, sort of adamant that we should all reach our potential. And work doesn't necessarily need to be our potential. I mean, I said this earlier, didn't I? What about musicians? What about poetry? What about dreamers? Um, and I, I'm a big advocate, and so are many in, in uh, the London Unemployed Strategies group, LUS, the LUS group, about a universal basic income, which could allow us all to be whatever it is that we want to be. Why should work be the big aim, be the big focus? Mm -hmm. That really, some, it's not, it does con, um, concern me that um, there can be that push about as if work needs to be the, the be all and end all. It can be for some, it doesn't need to be. Uh, so um, the future of, of, um, of my project would be quite interesting, hopefully, on focusing on that universal basic income, about just the diversity of people, because you know there are people here in, in the room, so I've introduced the table. Here in the room, we've got representatives from some of the seven groups, some of our volunteers. Uh, we have uh, somebody from the GLA, we have the WEA, we have um, our Trades Council comrades, and, and there are many of you that I don't know, but hopefully during the question and answers you'll introduce yourself, but a very varied bunch and lots of opinions. So the name of this fringe is the future of social security. We have a new Labour government. Will it make a difference? Will it make enough of a difference? How can we force it to, to make the difference that we need. It's all to be to be seen. Somebody said to me earlier, it's very early days, we've got to give them a chance. So let's see how we go. Uh, so the, um, the focus uh, this evening is going to very much be on our two speakers. And during the questions and answers, I'm sure the volunteers from, from my project will speak up and so will uh, many of you. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our speakers. We've just got some people coming in. Let them grab a sandwich. Very welcome, everybody. And um, 
we're going to hear from Angela and let me just say it's Angela Grant again for uh, our new people that are coming in and um, Angela's going to give a, an introduction and then we'll, we'll run some videos. <coughs> Okay, and, and thank you so much for inviting PCS along. I think it's really important that, that we are that we do have a seat at the table. Um, certainly, when we are the in, in our group in DWP group, we obviously uh, implement social security. We are the the department that works on social security that challenges the ministers on social security so it is important that we are on, on the ground in anything we believe anything that is happening within our communities that, that we know about what's happening and that we are working with community groups and with other unions and in anybody we can to make sure that we can all push in the same direction to see that we have a good decent social security system in place so thank you for um inviting PCS along to speak. I'll start by saying, you know, we do we work directly to, to government and how disappointing it has already been the Labour Party within their first hundred days when they, you know, that they should be making inroads into supporting our communities and what we have already seen is further, you know, attacks on our community. And I say that because we have we immediately in our union, we wrote to Liz Kendall as she became the new minister uh, for the Department of Work and Pensions and we asked, one of the things we asked was for her to immediately remove the, the, the benefit cap, the two child benefit cap and we have seen that, that the Labour government have no mind to remove that benefit cap. They have the ability to lift thousands of children immediately out of poverty and they refused, they have refused so far to do that. And then we have seen the attacks on our pensioners where, you know, cold weather, the difference between cold weather payment and, and warm homes payment, we're going to call it cold weather payment because it is a cold weather payment, although it's the warm, the warm payment that, that our pensioners should be entitled to. We are looking at, at you know, citizens of, of, of this country that have given their lives in work, they have paid tax. And rather than see Keir Starmer make the difficult decision of taxing the rich, he has made what he believes is a difficult decision to take warm payments, warm weather payments away from the most vulnerable in this country because our elderly in the winter are the most vulnerable in this country. We have seen the numbers of deaths from cold, from hypothermia, and yet he has taking the opportunity to go for the low-hanging fruit. That is not a difficult decision. He was on the news yesterday and he smiled as he said it, a bit of a nervous giggle. You know, this is a, we, we have to make difficult decisions. That is not, that is the easiest of decisions, isn't it? So there is real disappointment from our union and I think you can see it right across our communities in what this Labour Party has done so far. We never expected them to be the cavalry coming over the hill to save us all. I think there's a lot of us that had mistrust in the Labour Party. We know that, and, and I'm gonna use this the right and left wing here because we know that they have moved to the right. And I am seeing, certainly since all of the, you know, you'll see what happened in Liverpool last week with the rise of, of, of the far right. We're seeing that again, that left is becoming a really dirty word. People are saying it's those lefties, it's those lefties. What our communities are failing to realise is that they are left. They are the people that are that, that want to see socialism. They are the people in the, their houses who want to be able to pay their bills, who want to make sure that, that the rich are being taxed and that, that there is, you know, that, that money is, is, is shared out, that, that the wealth of the country is shared out so everybody benefits from it. They are, by default, left, but they feel that they are right. People that are, are so left, they're sitting in poverty saying it's all these lefties that are doing it. And it's this rhetoric, isn't it? This rhetoric and this, this propaganda that we have to challenge and, and we have to keep busting those myths. So we have seen, you know, Keir Starmer, we didn't expect him to, to give us the best of everything, but we did expect to see something, something from this Labour Party. And we are still waiting to see something. Early October, you know, they will be talking about, you know, what's happening with our pensioners early October. And somebody said to me, but what can we do about it? You can write to your MP, that's what you do about it. You can lobby your MP. Because again, we've got people in our communities thinking, you put your cross in the box, your MP goes and does the job. 
And it's not that, is it? We have to keep pressing those MPs and telling them that they work for us and we want to see what they are doing. So we wrote to Liz Kendall immediately, and I'll just give you a, a flavour of the things that we asked for. Enter sanctions, of course we want to enter sanctions. Labour Party introduced them. Tories made the most of it and started punishing people worse than ever to the point of death by sanction. We have asked the Labour Party to remove sanctions. We want to see an end to, to that punishment. We want to see a service that, with, that has real support at its heart, fully funded, where we can support communities. We want to see a um, real, real reform of um, a, re, you know, like a return of the social fund. The social fund has been put out into city councils. It was then ring fenced, and then the money disappeared. Who? What do you do if your kids need a new bed and they don't, and they're sleeping on the floor? You used to be able to go to the social fund and the social fund would provide that payment. We want to see social fund move back into social security. But the biggest thing that we want to see is a complete overhaul of the system. When we hear talks of ending social, you know, ending universal credit, just stop it. Stop universal credit. That, that at the time is not the best thing to do until you have something to put in place of it. Because if you just remove social security, if you remove universal credit without having any safety net, where does that leave us? So yes, we want to see an end of it, but we want to see a system put in its place that will work for everybody. So we've spoken to a number of our members, as you can imagine, they bring the worst stories to us. And a couple of members that work in on the universal credit system were telling us about what happens with the, um, the work capability assessment. When those assessments are happening, in PIP and they also happen for universal credit to see if members should be in, in the um, in the health group. I think that sounds awful. Some of the, the names that they have for some of these groups in DWP, it just it just doesn't sit right with us. But they have people that are in the on the health journey, as they say, which means that if you're you know, if you're sick and uh, or you have any kind of disability underlying condition, you'll be put in a certain group. And what is happening? They are asking, the department is demanding a sick notice. <laughs> so immediately you have somebody that has a disability, they're not sick, they have a disability. That is, that is their, their authentic self. Yeah. And they're told to go to a doctor to get a note to say what it is that is wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with them. So stop saying that. Again, it's that language, isn't it? If you're disabled, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> it's back to that medical model rather than the social model of, of disability. So, so they go and they have to get a note to say that they cannot work. And they put that note onto the system. Because of the, the, the delay in the system time, if that person doesn't get another sick note in four weeks, they are thrown out of the health group and they are put into the intensive work search review. And that is where the problems start happening for people that have disabilities. So when that happens, where does it leave somebody that cannot go into the job centre 10 times, as is happening with this, with this new procedure? They can't go in every week for 10 weeks every week for 13 weeks because they have they are incapacitated they cannot they cannot you know attend the office what happens to them they're sanctioned they become homeless and they end up on the street and that is what we need to stop and that is what pcs want to be doing on the ground so we've written to liz kendall i think it was 4th of july or maybe 24th of july we wrote to her and we're still waiting for a response <laughs> strangely enough but we have found out just this morning, we did some good work with Alison McGovern when she was the shadow minister and she wanted to make a little bit of a name for herself to say all the things that she wanted to do. She was working with PCS, she was in on the ground. Since she became minister oh. for employment, we've heard nothing from her either. But we have just found out that she will be attending one of our job centres on Wednesday. And we're trying to get a little bit of a welcome party for her at one of those jobs that was on Wednesday. I was hoping it was where the guards would be on strike because we're in the middle of a strike at the minute as well. Our G4S guards and PCS are taking strike action now and it's a fantastic action that they're, that they're taking. So we were hoping that it would be in the middle of a strike and she wouldn't be able to get in. We weren't going to tell her, just going to let her turn off with, 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 with the office closed. But um, it's not, it's a co-location office. So that it's a job centre within a city council office so the, the doors will be open. So we have to try and make sure we have a welcoming party for Alison McGovern at that job centre, job centre in Blackpool. Not sure which one it is yet, but we will, but we will be finding out. So that's pretty much where, where, where we are at, at the minute. Um, we're looking at, you, you've heard, you heard um, Jerry Hunt saying that there were 630,000 um, economically inactive people that are sitting pretty much, you know, 
intimating that they are sitting sponging off the benefit system. And what they want to do is get all of those people back into work. The number I think is, is greater than that. I think it's more like, like 700,000. But when, when you look at those people that they are trying to push into work again, they are trying to bring people in for 10 weeks and 13 weeks and, and even, even longer than that, if they can get away with it. But what we know is that that was happening under the Tory administration. So from now, it's, it's anybody's game, isn't it? It's all there for us to be asking for. It's there for us to be putting down to the Labour Party to say, this is what we want to see from you. We want you to be the Labour Party as was. Do the job that you were, you were created to do. Look after your communities, look after your workers. And we did slide into our letter, you know, if you help people, if you give people some money, put money in the pocket of, of those that will spend it, not those that will put it into their bank account. That is how your economy will work. Yeah. If you want to fix your economy, give people some money to spend. Yeah. Let's not see all these shops closing and, you know, supermarkets taking over from every single corner shop. So you have to, so you're pushed into paying you know, the prices of the supermarket, supermarket and the corner shops cannot survive anymore. Let's give some people money in their pocket. And it's a win-win, isn't it? People are, are, are you know, they, they've got money, they can buy food, they can be healthy, they can be productive. And those that can work will work. And those that cannot work, tax will be paid so that those people can, can have some support from the system that is there to support them. So I could go on forever, <laughs> as, as, you, as you can imagine. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm going to leave that there for now. They're the main points that I wanted to get across. But I'm, I'll finish by saying how important, you know, as, as I did in the beginning, how important it is for us all in these rooms here to, to stay involved with each other, make sure that whether you're in a union, whether you're in a community group, whether you're a member of DPAC, wherever you may sit in your community, please, Let's all keep in touch and let's make sure that we are the cavalry. We are the people that will be the vanguard of, of, of the communities and make sure that we are put, putting pressure on our MPs and on our governments to bring about real change. Thank you. Powerful stuff. And uh, united, we will not be defeated. So excellent. And I think you'd like me to run your video now. Yes, isn't that right? I didn't know you had it, but yes, please. Yeah, is, is, okay. it, is it our video? Yeah, you're, of course. Ah, okay. Yeah, we've got the PCS video. Oh, brilliant, thank you. So I hope the technology works. <laughs> uh, I have the kiss of death. I didn't realise it was ours that you were I, talking about. I thought that's yeah. the best intro to the video ever. <laughs> 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 Hopefully it's not saying the same yeah, thing. I've never stolen anyone's thunder. No, 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 no. Okay, so hopefully it works. The government have announced a whole series of additional measures for universal credit, changes to uh, the qualification for universal credit, hundreds of thousands of more people brought into the universal credit trap. So more and more people in work who are working on low paid wages are going to have to therefore do even more to continue claiming universal credits. They're desperate to sort of push, just to push people into work, any kind of work, regardless of quality or even pay, regardless of childcare circumstances, care and responsibilities. If anyone can get more work, they are essentially being told to get that work, otherwise they'll be sanctioned. This latest iteration of reforms in universal credit is the latest in a long line of very damaging reforms which have culminated in this universal credit system. So we have to see this latest UC reform within the context of what's been a long-term decline in the welfare state and policies that are damaging to, to our members and to staff. The history of, of the, the government, especially the current government, is to actually drive through um, benefit changes, whether or not they have enough staff to implement them or not, whether or not you know, our members are able to deliver um, those changes. The level of staffing is astonishingly low, stressful and unsustainable. Staff leaving, sickness, etc. are by far the worst I've ever seen. The caseload sizes are too big already. There is no rest period, there is no um, calm period. Is that you have people dealing with upwards of 2,000 claimants, dealing with all of that stress, dealing with all of the anger from claimants, trying to ensure all of these people are paid on time and the correct amount, getting paid minimum wage. 
I'm totally worn out, physically and mentally. My health has suffered enormously. Constant pressure, poor pay and staff leaving to go to better jobs with better pay and less stress. So I've resigned. I felt I had no other option. There is an understanding in some government circles that the DWP will need more staff. It's why the department's been given authority to increase the staffing by 20,000 over the next uh, 12 months. But that was prior to the announcement made by the Chancellor. New policies should not always mean new people. So today I'm freezing the expansion of the civil service and putting in place a plan to reduce its numbers to pre-pandemic levels. PCS members are impacted by universal credit in two ways. There's obviously the latest changes to the universal credit benefit system that our members will be expected to implement um, when that comes in. But also more and more now, PCS members are having to claim universal credit. So frontline government employees having to claim benefit to make ends meet. The days where being a civil servant brought some respect or kudos are long gone. It's essentially a minimum wage job. You can get higher entry level wages at a supermarket with less stress. One of the sort of chronic issues within the DWP is quite simply low pay. The members are paid very poorly in that department. 35% of our members in the DWP said they were skipping meals. 8% said they used a food bank. Our members who are using food banks and can't afford to pay the bills, then the strain that has on their mental health will, will be huge. And that has a knock-on effect on their work as well and their claimants. So that's why it's a trade union issue for us. These are hard-working people. These are people who care. These are people who are passionate. All they want is to be paid for that, paid correctly, respected by management, respected by leaders, respected by MPs, to have their autonomy that they know how to do their job best and how to talk to their claimants the best. So we have a group of, sort of short-term aims for UC which would be about scrapping some of the very punitive measures that are involved with the universal credit, like the two-child limit, the benefit cap, the high reduction rates for people who have to repay benefits, which all have the, the, the main impact of pushing claimants into more poverty. And then beyond that, sort of the, one of the key things is the sanctions and conditionality. Sanctions does not do anything to support people back into work. Our members know that. We believe the government know that. PCS members are very, very clear though what they experienced during the pandemic when there was a pausing of all conditionality and sanctions is that they provided a much better, much fairer and more supportive service. Some of the longer term aims is our current policy is for UC to be scrapped and be replaced with a fairer system and the key thing for us in any long term reform is that our members and claimants should be at the heart of the process of building this new system because they're the ones who know it best. They deliver it, they use it. We've had great support from MPs, the Labour Party, SNP, Green MPs in the past and we'll be working with them in the future. Because we believe now is the time to campaign to say these changes are not workable, they are not fair, they will increase conditionality, they will increase the risk of sanction and that will not be anything other than detrimental to those who claim universal credit. The message that we need to continue to get across and PCS is determined to work with the United Community, with Disabled People Against the Cuts and other campaigning organisations is to make sure that we could campaign for a proper, fully resourced, fair and supportive social security system for the lowest paid and the hardest hit in society. on the PCS uh, position and demands, which I, I don't think many of us will disagree with. Any questions or any contributions from the floor? I would like to say Just one, 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 one second. You may not have been the first hand card. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two hands. So go ahead, Terry, you were the first. And we have three hands. So we've got Terry, Carmen and Lee. And then we'll... Um, Oh, and uh, it's also um, Matt. Thank you. Go ahead, Terry. Thank yeah, you. Good. And maybe introduce yourself so we, we know who's in the room. 
Um, Terry McLaughlin and I work for the Tiny Mere Centre Against Unemployment in Gated. Um, for me sins, I worked for the National Career Service for about three years before I, before I started this job. And what really horrified me was the, the workload of the mm. job centre people. I had, the, I had the luxury of interviewing about four or five people a day, doing CVs and all that with them. The, the people who I was sitting next to, the, uh, the work coaches, were seeing 27 or 30 people a day. Now, you know, if they work, they work seven hours, 24 a day, is that right? So that's 440, four hours, a minute. Um, that works out at something like 12 or 13 minutes plus a couple of minutes of your paperwork. Now, if you're five minutes behind and that happens regularly, these, these folk just can't get through that work. And to put more pressure on them and expect them to be the people who are supporting people in the work is absolute, it's, it's an absolute disgrace. And, um, you know, 20,000 probably won't even touch it. I don't suppose in terms of the extra staff. But um, the impact on, on folk who are coming in, who have got disabilities, or have got uh, health problems, is dramatic. You know, I, I, I saw a couple of people actually having grand mal fits in the office. The people who were like clearly ver like very vulnerable and who were being forced to come in because of like the, these this sort of uh, pressure on them to, to be looking for work. The guy, the, the people needed to be in hospital. You know, the, the state of people that you see coming into the job centres, the plight that people are in. And, you know, when I heard that this candle had been put in place, I thought, Jesus, <laughs> shit. And a little wee donkey. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that just shows you what to expect. You know, this is somebody who is, was it, what do they call them? Um, the liberal, um, was it um, liberal economics people? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, 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 you know, that, that way of the Labour Party. There's a, there's a poster we've got on the store of a meeting in, in the early 1930s in the big market in Newcastle, meeting of unemployed folk who were about to march on a hunger march down to London. And on the banner it says, it, it says something like work or, 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 full, uh, or a full living, something like that. And it says, you know, we want a seven hour working day to soak up an employment. We are still fighting those same battles nearly 100 years later. And, and if the Labour Party doesn't deal with that situation, it's, it's preparing the ground for more explosions like we saw a couple of weeks ago. Because you can, you can defeat fascism by giving people a fighting need about what they can yes. achieve if they organise and fight themselves. If you don't do that, you prepare the ground for a reaction. And that's what the likes of, of uh, Farage and his pals are, are, are hoping for. They're just waiting for that to happen. And I think that your man Starmer is going to walk straight into that if, yeah. we, if we don't change the direction that they're going. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> and then we have Carmen, please. Okay. I come from Spain. Um, basically, last year, in Spain, the socialist government what has the low inflation of the European Union economic area. And we increased, the Spanish government increased the minimum salary, increased the minimum pensions. And the way that we managed to have low inflation is because the Spanish government controlled how much electricity, how much gas, how much water could increase also basically regulated how much private landlords can increase their rents and was two percent so the reason that inflation is high is not because wages go high it's actually because prices for utilities are allowed to go whatever because prices in transport are allowed to go whatever because prices in private rent are going to go whatever so actually government regulation works 
And I take on the comment that you have made, Angela. Trickle economics don't work. Because you can have a person with a lot of money. Doesn't mean that he's going to buy a pair of shoes every single day. Doesn't mean he's going to buy a, a shoe a single day. It doesn't mean that he's going to have nine meals a day in a restaurant. It's a limit to what a person with a lot of money can have. But if you put more money, because you pay better wages, then it's people that can afford an extra pair of shoes, people that can afford to pay for, for a gift, people that can afford for places. And it's about having a balance. And um, for example, now in Madrid, that is the biggest community, you can go on one day a week, you can go to the cinema, if you are unemployed, you can have it a free ticket. So you can access uh, culture, you can visit museums, please, you can, inside the communities, in your autonomous community, you're an employee, you can travel free. So if you are, for example, in the Basque Country community, you can travel from Bilbao to San Sebastian free of charge if you're an employee. So you can go to, you know, to interviews, you can go to whatever. Uh, you have free prescriptions for everybody. So what the Spanish government has is moving towards is universality. So no matter how much you earn, you have free prescriptions. It's free prescriptions for everybody. It's free meals in uh, schools for everybody. And I think that the Labour Party should reclaim universality. And a good way of reclaiming would be to reintroduce child benefit to everybody. Not to have child benefit mean test, but to everybody, and to probably fund child benefit. So, okay, you don't want to go uh, against the two limit caps. Fine, don't 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 stop the two limit caps. But if you increase child benefit to everybody, for every child, that you can fight poverty, and perhaps. You know, keep it a semblance that you are not giving oh, to the undeserving these people that keep having kids and blah, blah, blah. Because there are families that are in there that are not getting it. That is when you create the tension. Why they get it, I don't get it. Why they get it, I don't get it. And if we have universality as, as, a, as a policy to introduce, that would be helpful. Thank you, Carmen. Okay. Yes. Lee? My question is in two parts. Um, one around universal credit. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, universal credit in a system, it, I don't you know, not, doesn't work. But what people don't seem to realise is that uh, it has a knock on effect. I mean, you talk about the government wants to do the work, pay for benefits and stuff like that. But access to work, the backlog on that means that people who are disabled and they've been forced to go to work, smaller companies won't employ them because they can't afford to pay. I work for Royal Mail. At the moment, I'm going re I'm to reapply for my access to work. Luckily, Royal Mail is paying for that at the moment because they know that they can afford it and they'll get that money back. But a small company, they can't afford to do that, but they rely on access to work. And everybody knows that every pound you spend on access to work, you make four pounds back in you know, the tax system. No. So, um, no, I mean, I've been, I've been in the system of my access to work six months, I've been waiting now. No. So, I, I chased it out and I demanded to do in the process for in the process. It's the same with my PIP. When I was on disability living allowance, I had to go to court for it, and I am disabled. I got given it for life. When they transferred me over, I've not got to apply for two years. My condition ain't going to get any better. No. So, no, that's. My part one. So, so we need to get this government understanding that the issues that are faced are issues that shouldn't be there. They was they were they weren't there before the Tory party got in and bought universal credit in and put all these small little things in place. Most of it, lifetime guarantee stuff like that, and they were like uh, legal things that were in there before the Tories got into power. They need to bring bring those back, and that will reduce the sanctions on a lot of things. Second part of my um, no, thing okay. is that it's an attack on P PCS or anything like that, and I've said this to Brett and I've said this to other people. And 
but you are the face. You know? And I think, I've said this to the people who are PCS members in my local area, I think we need to be more public about, you know, um, saying that this is, well, you, you sat here today, I've listened to you, and I totally respect what you said, and I agree with 100% what you said, but that's not the public message that people are stealing, and I think that's what you guys, as a union, need to put that out there more, and uh, get the public back on side with you, because I'm, I, you know, I got really frustrated the other day, and Bert will tell you, and I had a bit of a blow up and nothing, because I, my wife turned DWP, because they cancelled my appointment, three hours before my appointment, I took day off of work. So I've lost a day pay, yeah. Yeah. and I don't now, no. I mean the bloke actually had the cheek on the phone to come in and say to me, why well, are you claiming benefits for all work? Because rent and everything is through the roof, and my wages don't keep up with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but I had a bit of a blow up, and then we had a, we had a conversation, didn't we? And then, I, like, like I said to Dika, you guys are the public face, that's why you're the villains. I think you need to be more public and say, look, this is what we're trying to do. Like you said, you both wrote the lake candle. If you were being more public about that, the public would be more on um, your side. And they probably would you know, stand with you. I mean, that put me more pressure on Labour now to actually go, hang on, we need, to, we need to, the public on side with the, you guys and the workers. We need to listen to this and resolve it. And it probably gets resolved a lot quicker rather than, it almost feels like politicians that are playing you guys off against the public. I mean, you've got people like Pavard play, playing into that and you know, they get the reactive you know, behaviours and stuff. I mean, you've got organisations like you know, DPAC and uh, you know, disability organisations like me and Brett set on, you know, that went to Geneva and were trying to hold the government to account on these things. All these uh, two groups seem to be playing off against each other rather than working together. And I think if everybody was more public, you know, and united together, we would probably get a better response. But Labour needs to you know, man up, get in the room and listen to us, instead of just running away, saying what they want to uh, think we want to hear and running away when that actually comes to rolling the sleeves up and getting the work done. Thank you, Lee. Well said. And then Matt, and uh, then we'll hand back to Angela. Hi, my name's Matt Poynton. I'm the president of the WEA, Workers' Education Association. Just a, a simple question. Uh, under the Premier Conservative government, particularly under the leadership of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, there was this attack on the civil service, the blob. They are the problem. They are what's taking democracy away from people. And your organisation, I guess I'm talking to Angela primarily here, you're, you, you are the problem, you're being demonised. Is that going away under Labour? And if it is, what are you going to do for when... Because we'll have a Tory government again in the future one day. You know, it might be five years, ten years, who knows. What are you going to do to counter that? Because that narrative, I can see, particularly with the direction the Tory party's going, is only going to get stronger. Angela, uh, Mike would like to make a contribution, ask a question, and then we'll hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, some of it is kind of some of it is a kind of statement and observation. Really. I'm Mike from the Are You Rights group, and uh, I've got to say that like the the staff at our job centre. I mean, amongst, amongst our group, there's a lot of distrust in the DWP, but the staff at our job centre that we meet at liaison meetings, whatever, have always been very fair and professional within the constraints of the system they're in. They're not monsters, although they're involved in the monstrous system. I think the issue that we've had mostly with our members is that uh, it's the contractors and the outsourced yeah. assessments yeah. That, are, that play the hardest and unfairest. Yeah. And there must be some incentivisation in the way that those contracts are set. That they're, that they're given sort of free, but they're either given free reign or they're told there's the contract and whatever you can make out of it is yours as part, as, part, as part of the gravy. They get so, yeah, so, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation that you find yourself in, but I think you've definitely got to try and reclaim that ground. The, the, the public service element of the DWP, failings, are, yeah, everything's got failings, but the public service element of the, of the DWP is definitely worth fighting for, and the way that some of the inefficiencies of how the system is working for, we can let that go and maybe get more public ownership into the assessment system would be a, would be a start. Because all I see is that the the the, uh, the the profits that are going to the contractors is is kind of what's in, 
it's kind of what's always poisoning the system for the end user. On our side of the fence, it looks completely different to what it looks like from the DWP in previous administration and possibly even in the current one. I mean, as they settle in, it's, yeah, how they, they go. I think they, I think some of the companies have seen how far they can get their nose into the trough. And it's going to be quite hard to get it back out of there. Thank you. Okay, it's quite a bit to come back on there, isn't it? <laughs> it's testing me now. <laughs> uh, okay, and, but there's nothing there that we haven't heard before, but for what's happening in Spain. But it's all, that that's not rocket science, is it? it, it it's what we know. So I'll, I'll start by saying, um, when we look at, at staffing and the figures that when you talk about being in the unemployed centre and, and you have people coming in, and you know that our members are looking at sometimes 25 and 30 cases a day, we are hearing that our members have got 2,000 plus cases in their workload for one person. I don't know if you know that we presented last November a 54 page dossier on staffing, um, a staffing crisis, mental health crisis within our staff. Um, we presented that to the department and to the minister. We, we're still waiting again, November, we're still waiting for a meeting on that as well. So the departments are more than aware of, of what is happening. They know that they are in crisis. They're not denying it, and they are saying to us, we've got funding, and, you know, and we are trying to recruit. The problem they've got is minimum wage, the, the stress and the pressure that, that you're going to go through working with DWP. Who is going to want to work there? They are trying to make themselves an attractive employer. It's more attractive to stack shelves in Aldi than it is to work in DWP. So we are fighting a, a, a battles on both sides because we know the work needs to be done. We know that we need staff. They're agreeing that we need staff and they can't bring the staff in. So what do they do? Unless they get some funding from the government to give us a better pay rise and to take the pressure off, they are gonna be sitting under this in, in, in a vicious circle, aren't they? So there is work for us to do on that again. That is what we will be pressing on government. We are also pressing obviously for more staff and for them to up our pay a little bit, but five percent isn't going to take us that far, is it? So, you know, it's a watch this space for for pay in DWP. Uh, we've got twenty five thousand of our members are sitting on the minimum living wage. We have got more than that number that are sitting on universal credit. They are claiming universal credit as they are trying to 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 to. Um, provide that service as well. So they are going under because they can't afford to live and they are still trying to provide a service for others. So our members know the difficulties and we talk about you know, the public face of DWP and it's right, we need to get, of course we need to get out there the work that we are doing more, the fact that we've sat at select committees and we've told governments that sanctions do not work. But how do you do that when you've got a right wing press that is putting, that is, that is shutting down all of the stories that we are trying to get out there. We work with, with Unite Community, the work that we've done on sanctions with, with Unite Community. We've done some fantastic work together and we are going to be doing more work together. You know, that those plans are, are in, in you know, we're putting those plans in place for us to do more working together. But, you know, Disability News, let's just talk about Disability News. They ran a piece on our, on our department to talk about the disabled people that are working, that have mental health disabilities in DWP. So you get news outlets that, that will, that will you know, run, run stories for us, but it's difficult for us to get out there as much as we want to. Um, so there is that. Um, when you, you talk about what happened in, in Spain, of course, that is, that is like manna from heaven hearing that, isn't it? When you think that it could be such a perfect system if they would listen to us in the room rather than listen to these think tanks that are telling them to squeeze everybody. If you squeeze pay, you can keep the money to yourself. What is the point in keeping that money in the government coffers if it cannot generate more income for the country? Pay people, give people more money. You know, look at universe, universality, totally agree with that. We should be having free prescriptions. We should be having free parking in, in everywhere you need to go so you can go shopping without getting a fine because you just parked somewhere. All of those little things that are quite easy to do that would help us to, to, to grow the economy. And then we can start probably looking after each other, looking after our, our communities. You mentioned access to work and, and the backlogs, Lee. It's horrendous, isn't it? You've got access to work, you've got, I talked about pensioners before, the backlog for people that are trying to claim their state pension, backlogs are huge. PIP 
People waiting for disability benefit, backlogs are huge. Mm. Child maintenance, wherever you look in DWP, there is a huge backlog and complaints are going through the roof. They cannot keep on top of the complaints because they haven't got enough staff to do the day job, never mind look at all the complaints where. So the system is in total meltdown at, at the moment. Again, that's what we want this government to be looking at to make sure that they start listening to the unions. I did a bit of a video today and I wasn't, I didn't mean to say it, but I was, they said, have you got a message for Liz, Liz Kendall? Yeah, come and work for PCS. Every minister, come and work for PCS because we can tell you how to run the system properly because we are on the ground, you know, front, front line. Um, be more public, that was from, from yourself, Lee. Um, Cancelled appointments, I'm trying to see, I've got that many notes here. I do want to say though, where PCS is strong, sanctions are minimal. Where PCS is strong, the system is running so much better. We have been, you saw on the film there, we have been trying to um, make sure that we are fighting, fighting sanctions, but we are trying to make sure that when we get the new system underway, every single, every single area is, is covered how how do we do that it's going to be a massive job of work isn't it i'm talking about what's going to happen in the future when you look at what happened during covid our members were being lauded during covid because we have work coach empowerment our work coaches were allowed to do the job that they needed to do people were turning up saying you know i'm out of work i haven't got any money straight away they were getting a payment and for the first time, we actually pulled ourselves out of the gutter because our name was in the gutter. Just outside, of, as we come out of COVID, we, we saw the department employing, uh, I don't know the, the figures I've got them in front of me, but employing um, people into the fraud directorate. And they brought people into the fraud directorate to try to claw back money that they paid during COVID. And that was the beginning of the department putting us back into the gutter. So when you say, how can we keep ourselves it's going to be difficult isn't it but if we can work with this Labour government now to put in place a proper social security system and take away all of the bad things that the Tories done all of the punitive measures that the Tories done that move back to the medical model blaming people for having a disability bringing people in for assessments every year or every five years when they know that their conditions are not going to get any better if we can build a proper fit for purpose service that is fully funded and we can see we can make sure that that works and we can let our community see that it is working we will stop all of the tommy robinsons and the nigel farages we will be creating not just not just providing money for those people that cannot work because you know we talk about un unemployed people don't we every person that is unemployed is an unemployed worker they're not just people that are just sitting there because they don't want to go to, to work. It's because governments are failing to provide employment for people. So we can make sure that we are looking for, after every single unemployed worker, at the time they're unemployed, look after the sick, look after the disabled, look after the elderly, look after our children who are our future. Give them some free milk back in school. Children are, you know, rickets is on its way back. How can that be in, you know, in, in the 21st century? So there are ways that we can do this, but we need to make sure that we fix it now while we can, while we have the Labour Party here, and let our communities see that this is what happens when you have a government that is listening, that looks after its, its citizens, and when we have a civil service that is fully funded, that we can actually be proud of, a civil service that is not sold off to the highest bidder because they're still trying trying to 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 dwp are still trying to bring in outside you know going out to, to, to these agencies to try and fill gaps where they can't we look at our we've got people that work in, in the digital um on di digital processing and because dwp can't pay them the market price they go out to outside bring people in pay that contract rather than pay their own staff how can that be right? So there is so much work that we can do to fix this. But it starts today, and it starts with Liz Kendall, it starts with Alison McGovern, and it starts with Keir Starmer. So we have to put pressure on those people to fix the system now and make sure that it stays fixed.
excellent uh, responses there. Thank you so much. The working together is just so, so important. And as you'll know, there are coalitions uh, springing up all over the place. Um, uh, speaking of writing to Liz Kendall, um, JRF turned to us, ZUK Mind, they wrote to her in July as well about the PIP, um, the, um, uh, the idea that the pr proposed changes to PIP and what we need to do is join together and elevate our voices. And, and as we know though, um, the trade union movement can sometimes be a bit, it can be hard for sometimes the unions to come together and work. Um, and that's what the left do sometimes. We fragment and we, whereas the right wing, as we know, stay somehow united and, and, and bypass us and, and fill the gaps. So hopefully, um, you know, united, we will get this Labour government to do the right thing. Because as we all know in this room, if we don't do it quick, the far right are ready to swoop. Um, if you just look at the vote share for the last couple of Labour by-elections, down 20 percent you know they're barely they're barely hanging on really and that that void is is where the far right are going to swoop in but I'll, I'll be quiet now because we're about to hear from unite um and i'm handing over to brett sparks so a round of applause please and, uh, I don't think you want the video first no nope. no no we'll speak first and we'll, yes. we'll finish off with the video Thank you. that makes sense doesn't it um first off i want to just give you some figures guys because um the first one is going to be 2022 and that was the year of the mini budget the disastrous mini budget when uh the then chancellor introduced a raft of changes to universal credit which meant working claimants were then brought into conditionality that is affected over one million working people 77% of those affected are women. 28% of them are disabled or have a disability or a long-term illness. There are 7 million people now in this country, 7 million workers who claim universal credit. That is 20% of the entire British workforce. That is a shocking statistic, isn't it? You know, we've had 40 years of neoliberalism and what we've got is we've got the working class now, the working poor. That's the fact. The fact is, what we're doing is, you, me, and everybody in this room are subsidising bad employers who refuse to pay a proper wage. And what is happening is that those workers are forced to attend the DWP and ask for a handout. That's appalling. If a company can't afford to buy its supplies, it's not a functioning company. So why is it that if a company can't afford its labour, it's bailed out by the state? I really, I don't understand that at all, in one little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about how these changes are and what they come in and, and how they're going to affect working people. Um, what will happen is that uh, a million people, over a million people, are now being moved into conditionality street. So all that means is that they may need to attend the work coach once or twice, one week or, or a fortnightly, yeah. right? Those meetings can take place during their work time. They have no legal right to rearrange those meetings if that fits in their work time. In fact, they've got no way of contacting the job centre. Right? If they turn up five minutes late for that meeting, they get sanctioned. If they can't get the time off work to attend the meeting, they get sanctioned. If they can get the time off work, the chances are they're not going to get paid for that leave. So they lose a day's wages. And this is to increase their earning potential. Very, very strange. Very strange way of doing it. Um, average sanctions nine weeks, guys. Do you know what that means in monetary terms? They lose at least 20%. They will lose nine weeks worth of universal credit. That's approaching a thousand pound that the government are taking off of people, the poorest people in our society. I can't afford to lose a thousand pound. I don't know anyone else can. So how can people who are looking for work afford to lose a thousand pound? 
because their bus was late and they turned up five minutes late for the meeting. I said, that's just shocking. Absolutely shocking. Um, if they're unable to increase their hours at work, but they've been instructed to do so by the DWP, they get sanctioned. Irrelevant if their employer has any more hours to give them. Um, or they may be instructed to find better employment with no support. So they'll be told, we'll get a second job. Now, for those of us who are trade union officers, no, there's a little clause in virtually every contract that says you have to ask permission for your main employer to get another job. So you could be in breach of your contract by doing that. Um, holidays. This is something we found out, which actually shocked us. If you are claiming universal credit and you're working and you accrue your holidays, we all accrue our holidays, don't we? That's what we earn as part of our package. You can't take those holidays because you're still required to carry out the job search. So even though you've accrued your holidays and that's a benefit of, to, to you, you're not able to accept it. You're not allowed to take it, which is in direct conflict with employment law. And we're looking at see if we can actually look at, um, at targeting that legally. So coming up to two years ago now, we, start, we, we, we found out about these changes and Andy, who's sitting there, um, and I started briefing our reps in the southwest of what was coming because we thought our reps need to know this because who are the first person they're going to go to if they need to attend a work coach meeting? They need to go and speak to their rep so they can arrange time off, for instance. So we needed to do that. Very, very quickly, it was picked up nationally how important this was. And a motion was passed through the United Policy Conference last year, which turned this into a national campaign. We've been working on that since. And, you know, we've got some materials here. Guys, please take them. A lot of effort goes into these. So please, please use them. Um, we've also developed a model motion, uh, a model agreement that you can take to your employer, asking for them to agree things like paid time off to attend work coach meetings, use of IT systems. Universal credit is digital by default. If you haven't got the, the systems, the equipment, or the know how, you are completely knackered when it comes to universal credit. Absolutely. And, and I don't know if anyone's actually applied for universal credit. It's a minefield. We've spoken to people who were surgeons who, you know, I spoke to a surgeon who um, had to give up his job because of COVID, because he got long COVID and couldn't work anymore. And he could not work his way through the application form for universal credit. Now you would have thought a surgeon would be quite, you know, quite switched on, highly educated person. So if he struggles, how is anybody else going to do it? You know, least of all, the, 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 you know, the least educated people in our society who've got very few skills. Um, the system is all stick and no carrot. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's incredible, isn't it? If you want a rich person to work harder, you give them a tax break. If you want a poor person to work harder, you, you sanction them. Strange. Um, so what we've done in this campaign is, apart from doing the materials, we've done lots of, I think we've spoken to somewhere like 2,000 people now about this campaign, and I know some of you have already heard it, so apologies if you've heard me again. Um, but we've also built a coalition up of people, um, politicians, we've spoken in Parliament at least twice, occasion, two occasions. Um, we've Employ, you know, we, we've engaged academics. Um, Manchester Metropolitan University have been excellent in supporting us. Um, as Lee said, DPAC, working very, very closely with DPAC. And in fact, um, we're actually looking at creating a trade union section of, of disabled people against the cuts. Um, and I'm working with, with Alan Clifford on that. But also businesses. Now we, we spoke to I've spoken to executives, senior executives at Sainsbury's and at Aviva, who just can't believe what they're hearing. 
because none of this was announced. It was sneaked out, in, in, you know, at the bottom of the budget each time. And so if we hadn't had that, you know, if we weren't on the ball, like us colleagues in PCS, if this wouldn't have, no one would have known about it. The businesses don't know about it. No one's been consulted on these. And it's, it's unprecedented. It's the only country in the world that's ever tried it. Um, but other trade unions as well. And I, I, I really can't say this highly enough uh, and, and commend PCS. I think the work that PCS and ourselves are doing together it's been absolutely fabulous and we can't do it without them. Um, and so I, I, I thank Angela and, and Martin for their support in this. Um, they've been brilliant. But we've also got other unions on board. Equity have also been excellent. Um, I think we've spoken to, I've spoken to no less than six general secretaries about this. Andy's spoken to a few more as well. Uh, Baker's Union are on board. ASLEF are on board. RMT are on board. Um, you know, there's lots of different unions across the, the spectrum who are supportive of this campaign. Um, to give you some idea about what this actually means is if you're in work and you earn less than £892 per calendar month and you're claiming universal credit, you will fall into this conditionality. And that works out on average as well. So. It's um, it's really, really, <laughs> it's terrible. It really is. It's just, just let's just beat up the poor people again. <coughs> That's the only way I can describe it, you know. And then, as Sandra said, you know, they're backed up by their right wing rags, like the Daily Mail and the Sun and the Telegraph and the rest of them, you know, to kick people while they're down. And um, we need to change this. We need to change this, you know. Um, we know these people, the experts on this, if they're telling us it doesn't work, you've got to listen to them, haven't you? You know, we know this is, this is completely unworkable. Businesses know it's completely unworkable. Academics know it's completely unworkable. The only people who don't think it's unworkable is Liz Kendall. So we need to do that. And I'm just going to finish with one question for my colleagues in PCS. Is, just under a year ago, we spoke at, um, I spoke at an event in Manchester, which you, you guys attended. And at that time, DWP was saying they need 20,000, they need to employ 20,000 work coaches in the next 12 months. So it's nearly 12 months. How many of those have been employed? Do you want the truth? <laughs> uh, no lie to us. Do you want the truth? Okay, so DWP have done some massive recruitment. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been internal yeah. recruitment. So they've recruited their own staff into new positions yeah, yeah. and they use that as their recruitment figures. So I think they've only had about half of, of that, that yeah. figure. Maybe to, to, give, to give you some idea as well, is when I spoke at that, that, that event in Manchester, mm -hmm. I looked at the previous nine months and see what the turnover of staff was within the DWP. And they had a net increase of 500 over nine months. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when you're paying people minimum wage, and those people have to rely on universal credit to, to you know, to be able to survive. So, thank you, comrades. Um, I hope I didn't depress you too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got to be able to film now, aren't we? So we're going to watch a film that Andy and, and Brett have um, put together for us, produced for us. And then we'll hear from you. Members come to us now asking for financial support. That has increased dramatically. There was another rep. He was saying that two days before payday, he had ran out of electric. You know, there was nothing he could do. This shouldn't be happening. In the UK, 97 million people claim universal credit. Overall, 40% are in work but in some areas that figure is even higher. Under new rules, part-time workers who receive in-work benefits will be required to increase the number of hours they work. Those working 18 hours or less per week on the national living wage will effectively be treated as unemployed. They will be required to meet a work coach weekly or fortnightly, 
show evidence they are actively looking to increase work hours, keep an online journal up to date. Those working between 18 and 35 hours a week will have to undertake training as well as look to increase hours at their current employer or find additional work. Over a million working people will be swept into this draconian regime of in-work conditionality and sanctions. This change ignores individual circumstances, including the fact that many parents, carers and disabled people need to work fewer hours. If they're unable to comply with in-work conditionality, workers risk being sanctioned for a set period. This is a further attack on the lowest paid workers. The cost of living crisis has increased over the last 10 years. Obviously, the, the, there hasn't been huge wage increases. Um, for me personally, I claim universal credit due to leaving um, a domestic violence. Like, I left the Marils for home with just the clothes on my back. Claiming universal credit was a minefield. To claim universal credit, I had to prove that I was a victim of domestic violence. I had to give them um, police records of cautions that was issued to my soon-to-be ex-husband. My solicitor's letters, my wages, I had to prove everything. And it was really quite degrading, putting your whole life in front of someone you don't know. For them to decide whether you can get universal credit. They get universal credit to help me pay my rent. So, I mean, I'm grateful, I'm very, very grateful. Without that, I wouldn't eat, but it doesn't stretch. You know, it's, it's hard month to month. And I don't have any credit cards, TV packages. We're really, like, cautious, but still, you know, it is a struggle. I choose peace over finance. So I'd rather be safe than my daughter be safe. I always keep thinking, like, if the universal credit stops, what's gonna happen to my daughter and me? I, I you know, I, where do we go? You know, I've got the biggest contract I can have in my job that I do, so, so there's no more that I can do there. But actually, this last 10 years of austerity is still affecting us. You know, I don't think there's anyone that I know probably that isn't struggling. Some sectors are far more significantly impacted than others. We've discovered that about 75% of people affected by these proposed changes are women. Um, and in some areas of the economy, for example, the finance and legal sector, that rises to over 90%. So it singularly disadvantages women in work, and of course it also disadvantages disabled people as well. Uh, many of whom will be part-time, so they, they again will be disproportionately impacted. 700,000 lead carers of children have been hit by conditionality changes, 340,000 of which are working and over 27% are disabled. Speaking to employers about universal credit and related employment policy, part of which we asked them about their views around in-work conditionality. A lot of the employers were, were quite concerned about the policy. Firstly, they didn't really know about the policies. Uh, if we speak to businesses, uh, we know that there's a lot of flexible work that happens, so often people will be employed on a part-time basis but be expected to flex up. So if conditionality rolls out, employers were quite concerned that their flexibility would be uh, reduced. Demands and expectations from the work coach and the employer might clash and that puts both workers and employers in quite a, a difficult situation. Employers also voice concerns about the impact, the potential impact on the well-being of their staff if they're subject to pressure to look for work or to manage the, the, the demands of work with the demands of the work coach. In-work conditionality is untested anywhere else in the world. The government has not undertaken proper impact assessments of these policies on workers, families or employers. In-work conditionality also has a detrimental impact on employers. Now what we'd like to do is have every employee on full-time salaried contracts. That isn't workable in business sometimes. You just can't afford to pay people when you haven't got the work coming in. You're either going to give them a full-time job or you're not. You've got to employ them, you've got the cost of training them, and then they have to go off and look for another job because you're not pushing them up to the 18 hours that are required, or as it's going to be in the future, potentially 35 hours. And the problem for a lot of these employees are they have to rely on public transport, so there is a cost for them getting to the job centre and a cost to get back to work. And if they're coming out of work to attend an interview, they've lost 
half or maybe a full day of pay. The idea of releasing individuals to attend work progression interviews with, with work coaches is, is counterproductive to both the employer and the employee because it's actually taking the employee out of work to, an atten to attend an in-work interview. If they're running a number of jobs, more than one job, and there's no main employer, it becomes impossible. They've not consulted me and they've not consulted my peers. They've probably not consulted the unions either. Neither trade unions or employer associations were consulted about these unworkable changes. For workers, the potential of in-work conditionality causes additional stress, especially during a cost of living crisis that follows a decade of austerity. Sanctions can cut incomes by up to £90 a week, with the average sanction being nine weeks, triggering debt, rent arrears and food bank use. It's a downward spiral. The UK policymakers have focused on this work first approach, which is basically about moving into any job quickly. Any job, then a better job, then a career. Now the evidence base doesn't support that pathway. The approach that the UK is taking is an internationally unprecedented one, which really underlies the fact that it's really important that we are quite open and transparent about the new parameters that are being put in place. The fundamental driver of low paid work, poor progression in the labour market does not lie with individuals and what they are doing in work. The government's own research shows that conditionality forces people into poorly paid jobs rather than employment that matches their skills and aspirations. Ultimately it rests with employers and the quality of work that they are offering. Now we've got some brilliant employers, we can have fantastic examples of people paying a proper wage, uh, really ensuring that there are those pathways uh, in work for people to progress in, ensuring that people have got those opportunities to take up training and all those kind of uh, important things that we know create good employment for people. The DWP has got a really important role to play but also we need to be joining up with other departments who work with businesses or who provide childcare or training. Um, so it's really important that we don't operate in those policy silos in as much as the same way it's really important that we don't develop policy without all the people who are impacted. The DWP's own evidence has shown that increasing in-work conditionality has minimal impact on earnings. It's time to rethink how people are supported to progress in work. In terms of the in-work conditionality, it horrifies me. And I'm afraid it hasn't been fully thought through. The idea that you, you encourage people to apply for job after job after job, that costs us money, it costs us resources. We're a small business. I haven't got time to go through 50, 50 CVs. I want the job centre to find the right person that fits the bill, who has the capabilities and can apply for the job and I can then make sure that we take on the people that really, really are suitable for what we're offering. We need to be able to encourage people to have a choice about which direction their life is going in. Once you've done that, you will get your in-work progression. There's no need to sanction people. Just put them in the right job and in-work progression will come naturally. It needs a complete rethink. As a union, we hold true to this view that uh, for a business to survive, uh, yes, of course, it's important that they're profitable and successful, but the employees are part of that success. And the, the basic premise of working is to give yourself a decent standard of living. If these changes are successful, is that we will worsen that. We will not make work pay, and we will actually discourage people from wanting to be paying their taxes uh, and working this will again worsen the situation of people on the very lowest of wages and conditions. But when you go from working when you're 16 and you work hard, and I do work hard, to, sh to struggle it, it's tough. We all at some point need a bit of help, you know, and there shouldn't be these caveats to that help, and there is so many caveats to universal credit those in work will be impacted by the proposed changes to universal credit. This will impact every single MP and every constituency and every sector of the economy. So all the trade unions are impacted. 
but it impacts people in the community as well. And that's why it's important that we all stand together. Say no to in-work conditionality. End it now. Questions and so we've got Katrin, we've got Lee and Kevin. and Kevin. So Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, I've been on the stall all, all, all a couple of days with you, which has been been great working uh, uh, talking to the only five workers centres. But I'm also a PCS rep in DWP as well as uh, on, on the trade councils. And I think um, for, <laughs> uh, my day job is, is I'm a PIP uh, MR writer as well, so I'm doing the mandatory consideration. So I think seeing things from the inside, I think it's not just about how stretched our resources are, but how stretched every single public service is out there. And I think it, it's scary, because uh, you know, uh, quite often the assessors put on no mental health input. Well, person has been trying for years to get mental health input and support and counselling, that's not out there. Those sort of services for, uh, in terms of uh, that support. Um, we deal obviously with, with people at very crunch times. Uh, they're, they're, they're ringing up anybody in, in, in public authority to try and get help. Uh, we've had situations where our members uh, have been um, remained in a job centre because they're so scared about letting this person out through the doors because they know they'll top themselves once they leave because there's nothing. But you can't get any crisis team out to deal with that person. Um, so you know, we've set up a, uh, um, some work, trying to work with other parts of the public sector to try and get you know, emergency help so that our members don't have to stay in the job centre. With, with, you know, our skill set is not counselling people and, and talking them down. We can, deal some, you know, we can deal with some emergency stuff in terms of money perhaps that's about our limit and, and you know I was uh, you know phone calls I've had where you know I've had somebody in their 50s with historical child abuse who just wants to talk to somebody in authority about that and, and get help I, I'm not the person to be ringing about that I'm trying to sort of see how I can sort out the managing in consideration but that's as far as I can go and but trying to get help for people and I, I, I we've been raising this as trade councils as well across public services in Wales in terms of what do we need to provide a good standard of living for people. We need to get people out of the benefit traps they need to be above. Uh, all the things in the welfare charter about decent income, so you're actually above benefit levels. Nobody in work should be on universal credit. Everybody should be getting a decent wage. But they need to afford housing. They need all of these things all linked together. So I think that's how we can work together to put real demands on this government is much wider than just the social security system. It's about decent housing, it's about decent income, it's about how we challenge the employers. So I think there's a real job of work here, a real positive programme that we can be putting forward and really challenge this government because I don't expect Ms Kendall to do anything, frankly. <laughs> she isn't even replying to PCS, um, so uh, they're not meeting with us. So, you know, I think there's, there's a job of work here, but, you know, it's our demands and the communities are behind us. And, and I think if we address it in that sort of way, in a very public way, how we all can work together, I think we can really make a, a real difference and push this government. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Lee? Um, I, I think the great point about um, the, the bigger numbers. Um, but also, I, I think you've missed something. You know, um, you talk about like employers and like, pay and stuff like that. But what the other side, the flip side of that is, is that there are people like me who are, I mean, I'm, I'm a full time worker, but because there is no social housing and I can't afford to buy, private rents are going like that and yeah. being pushed up by a state agent and a yeah. private company. Yeah. I mean, it didn't help but led to quite a trust economy, making mortgages virtually impossible. So many people that I speak to on Universal Credit are claiming for the rent support, yeah. just that, to fill that little gap, yeah. 200 quid a month, you know, whatever it is. And now we're being penalised 
working because we can't afford to buy houses, but there's no social housing as well. So I think that's something that you know uh, needs looking at as well. Yep, no, do you want to come back on that? Um, maybe just wait for Kevin right, and yeah. then um, Kevin over to you. Thank you. Round of applause for Lee because that was really fun. Uh, Yeah, my name's Kevin Jackson. I'm from Unison. I um, work for a very small charity where I specialise in giving people benefit support who have neurotypical conditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we really need to look at the scale of the problem. We've all been talking today about trying to get this new Labour government to cope and to help with how the situation is now. But from my perspective, this situation is going to get 10 times worse. I'll start with children with autism. There's hundreds of thousands of children um, with autism who are waiting for diagnosis. When they get that diagnosis letter from the, an organisation called CAMS, the first bit of advice it will say is, well, you can go off and get a DLA now because you've now got a diagnosis. I, I get referrals in from schools because the school can't negotiate an EHCP plan for the child and they say go off and get DLA and you can get money to help you with the situation at home. Going on to adult benefits, I get referrals in from that. We've had 15 years, well, we've had 14 years of austerity. I think by October the 30th we will have had 15 years of austerity. Next year we're going to have 16 years of austerity. I get referrals in from mental health services for aut autistic adults. They come and see me. And I said, well, what, what, who, I always like to know, who suggested you apply for PEP? Oh, it was the local mental health service. They put me on a waiting list, which probably lasts for two years. Why don't you go up and get PIP and pay for your help? I get referrals in from local authorities for people that want social care. I, I asked them, why did you, why are you coming to see me? Well, my local authority said, there's a two, two, year, two three year waiting list for services. Why don't you go off and get PIP? Uh, it, and, and pay for that yourself. That's the problem. Yeah. And if we don't, you know, we, we need to speak to this, Kendall, we need to speak to them, but we need to grasp the scope of yeah. the problem. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think the DWP, some of the figures I think are false, but the DWP did a, uh, some research on this, and they reckon the PIP bill is going to go up by two thirds by just the end of this decade. There's Six, I think between 60 and 70,000 people waiting for a PIP tribunal at the moment. You know, you'll know that 80%, I do PIP tribunals, 80% of people win them. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we need to look at. You know, the Tories were talking about 18 billion pound cut from current benefit spending. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of, of course, you, we don't have the tribunals, the whole thing, but then you can catch up with the rent. So it wasn't saying, let's freeze the rents, let's take control of the landlord class. That's not what Labour was saying. They were cooperating with the Tories, and, and certainly maybe they are cynic, but I don't see Starmer doing very much about it. So we need to support the trade unions. I think it's the trade union movement by starting with the communities that we can make a difference, that we can start pushing this government. If we are relying on Starman, this kind of what help us. <laughs> And uh, I'll just hand back to Brett. <coughs> I think all four of you are saying the same thing, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Effectively, uh, society's broken. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. Um, you know, recently they built some new houses where I live in Wiltshire. Um, but they weren't social houses. They weren't affordable houses. You know, they were brand new houses, three bedroom houses going to three quarters of a million pound each. You know, no one in no one in that little town could afford to buy them. You know, so we need social. We need we need council housing, not even social housing. We need council housing, a massive council housing housing um, program of building. Um, that's just one of the many many problems we've got in society. You know, I don't. I I, I think we're heading on October thirtieth. I think we're heading to austerity four point zero or whatever it is. Um, I can't see the, the Labour Party doing anything because, um, quite frankly, they're you know they're following exactly the same policies as the Tories. Economic policies. They've tied themselves into these ridiculous fiscal rules, which give them no manoeuvre at all. So how are they going to support working people? And it, it, I just, you know, it beggars belief. You know, it, if we look at you know we, we looked at the austerity, but if we, it goes back further than that. This goes back to 1979 and the introduction of economic policies that you know it's a good example guys i grew up in the 1970s and 80s now when i was a kid 40 hours of labor was enough to support a family now we're lucky if 80 hours of labor could support a family that's effectively you me and everyone else have become 50 percent less wealthy than we were in the 1970s i'm ready for catch until catch you got rid of the rent yeah, absolutely. And billionaires are increasing. Yeah. Oh yeah, they've, they've, well, they've, so, been, they've become billionaires now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. So, so basically um, what we have is the transfer of plus value. Basically they are stealing from the workers. Well, yeah. And that's you know, what we need to be clear about this. Absolutely. All you know, this profit that billionaires are making are stealing from us. Yeah. <laughs> Privatisation is a transfer of wealth, isn't it? From the yeah, poor yeah. to the rich. Yeah. It's absolutely. as simple as that. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of all these problems, now, um, I'm good, but I'm not Superman, all right? So I make no apologies for the fact that our campaign is quite narrow because we needed that to pinpoint in. So we needed that so that we could get some, some traction. <laughs> if we open the campaign up to take up in all these, at least, we won't get anywhere. You know, it's as simple as that. You need to know what your goal is to win a campaign. And if you don't know, that's why most campaigns fail. Yeah. Most campaigns fail because no one knows what they're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. You know, so we need to, so we make no apologies for it being tight. You know, if I could solve these problems, believe me, I would. But um, maybe I'll go on to the next one after I've won this one, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to start somewhere, but yeah, we have absolutely. to win it. Yeah, absolutely. So, comrades, we're coming to the end of the fringe. We're just coming up to a quarter past seven. Um, I just really want to. <clears throat> Thank Angela and Brett. Round of applause. And a huge round of applause for us, for you, for us together. I don't want us to walk away feeling doom and gloom, even though it is very, very concerning. We are the many. And we, uh, sometimes you need an enemy, don't you, to mobilise. And with the Tories in, we kind of kept hoping, oh, we'll get a Labour government. We've got a Labour government now, and we can see if it's going to happen or not. And I don't think our, I don't think our scope for, for patience is going to be very broad. And all I can say is the big charities, the big voices, the big trade unions, everybody's getting angry. So let's get ready to fight, stand together in unity, and we will win. Yes. Solidarity and thank you. Yes.